praises today, oh Lord. May our homes be filled with dancing. May our streets be filled with joy. Sing it out. May injustice bow to Jesus. As the people turn to pray. From the
worship him this morning, saints. Take your Bibles and open with me to 1 Peter in chapter 4. 1 Peter in chapter 4. Heavenly Father, as we open your holy scriptures, 
Lord, help us to open our hearts. Let us hear from you. Let us believe you. And Lord, let us apply. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been going through this series in 1 Peter. And the main theme of this entire book seems to be suffering for the will of God. That is, suffering persecution uh, for the sake of the Christian faith. How God has a purpose in that. I want you to see in this final portion of chapter 4, verses 12 through 19, I hope that this morning I can share with you some principles that are going to help you to face an environment that's hostile towards your Christian faith. What we're seeing in the world around us is an intensifying resentment towards the faith that we possess in Jesus Christ. And so it's going to become more and more difficult in your workplaces, in your school environments, even amongst your social peers to maintain, to walk, with an open Christian faith. So, I believe it's important that we understand some basic biblical principles that Peter brings out in the closing of this chapter. Let's start with verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you or to test you as though some strange thing happened unto you. The first thing you need to know about the persecution and animosity towards the Christian faith is that it's nothing strange. In fact, it is normal that you as a believer should come under fire for the convictions you hold in Christ. (laughs) The problem is you and I have been blessed with so much privilege and so much blessings and freedoms that when we come into a circumstance where we know we are the mark because of the convictions that we have and the beliefs we hold, it feels so bizarre to us. It feels so strange. And even... The words used, fiery. You ever notice that troubles come on in a hurry when they're satanic? (laughs) The devil doesn't just slowly come against you in this type of way. Now, there's other ways he's very slow and sneaky about. But when it comes to opposition from those who resent your faith, it comes on like that. You'll be in the workplace. You'll be in a situation. There'll be discussions. Views will be shared. Convictions will be expressed. And next thing you know, whoo! You're in the ring of fire. And we begin to think in those moments, wow, this is not fun. This is uncomfortable. This is wrong. And the apostle reminds the young converts, this is normal. (laughs) 
this is what you should expect. He said, when we walk with Jesus and we were trained by the Master, He told us, the servant is not greater than the Master. If they've hated Me, they will hate you. You can expect that the world despises you because of your devotion to Christ. It should be expected. It seems so unnormal to our experience here in the good old U.S. of A. But it has been the norm for sincere Christ followers throughout the ages. And it might be the norm for us too. We should expect it. Now, so the first principle is normal for the world to despise you for your devotion to Christ. Amen? The second principle we see in verses 13 through 16 and that's this. Don't think that your relationship with Jesus will go without having to pay a cost. Now, I want to be clear about this. It's important to understand that salvation is absolutely free. It doesn't cost you or me a dime. There's nothing we can do to earn, to pay, to acquire our salvation through our own merit or possessions. It is the free gift of God by faith because it was provided and accomplished by the perfect work of Jesus Christ when He died on the cross to pay for our sin. And He rose from the grave to give us a new life with God. That was accomplished. That was perfected. That cost you nothing. But somehow, it's easy to get to thinking because salvation was provided and it was free and it was ours to embrace simply by believing that somehow there's no cost involved in the relationship. But I dare say, there's no such a thing as a relationship that doesn't cost. <laughs> Some of you fellas, you, you, or maybe ladies too, you've been in, in passionate love relationships and, and, and I dare say it cost you something. I like to tease about my, my wife because she cost me right off the bat. My pa-in-law said he wanted two pigs <laughs> for that bride. She calls me right off the start. <laughs> Relationships cost you something. Hey, if you're going to maintain a friendship, it's going to cost you. You're going to have to invest in it. You're going to have to spend some time in it. There's some things you're going to have to sacrifice to put on the line to keep the connection. In a marriage, in an in a, in a intimate, romantic, passionate relationship, it's going to cost you a lot. You might have to forsake some friends. You might have to forsake some engagements. You might have to give up some hobbies. Any married man sitting here today or married lady alike can tell you there's a lot of things they enjoy doing that they don't do no more because they ain't got the time. They gave it up. When you have a relationship with Christ, it's going to cost you. The salvation is free. But the relationship to the Savior, that gets expensive. And Jesus, Jesus said to the disciples, don't plan on being my disciple without first counting the cost. Let me get into this a little bit with the Scriptures here. 
Salvation is free, but the relationship gets costly. You say, well, Brother Micah, how much is it going to cost me? It might cost you everything. What it costs you might not be the same as what it costs me. What it costs me might not be the same price you pay. Everybody's called to a different and unique walk, but we're all called the same, and it involves sacrifice for the relationship. Now let me read this. In verse 13, But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye re be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, He is evil spoken of. But on your part, He is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other man's matters. You know, it's interesting to me that Peter chose these four things to warn a church, don't be guilty of these. He's talking to church folks. He's not talking to the world. And he says, first of all, don't be no murderer. Second of all, don't be stealing. Third, <clears throat> no evil doing. No busybody. You think church folks have a tendency like the rest of the world to fall into troubles? <laughs> Unfortunately. Peter's telling us don't suffer troubles for that kind of thing. Don't suffer troubles for that. There is the possibility. We read all the time about great people in the faith that we find out we're doing some wicked things. It's disheartening. It's discouraging. Oh, it's a reproach to Christ. Don't be involved in that. And you say, well, I would never be a murderer. Well, we hope not. Well, I would, I would never be a thief. We, we certainly hope not. And then we get that one that says, don't be a busybody. <laughs> well, can't everybody be perfect, right? <laughs> it's a little closer to home with most of us. But he's said that to say, avoid that kind of thing. Verse 16, yet if any man suffer, not for doing wrong, but if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Friends, we need to arm ourselves with the awareness that our relationship to the Savior is going to cost us. A lot of times we come into the Christian faith like I did, expecting what we get. And there's so much we get. There's so many blessings. There's so many benefits. It's, it's, it's amazing the blessings that God's put on my life, particularly just for being a follower of Christ that I've enjoyed in this world. Now, that's not a prosperity gospel. I'm just telling you a fact. It's good to serve the Lord. But somehow, we come to the faith thinking about all that we can get and gain. And there's a lot to be gained. But we often fail to think about what is asked of us or the price we may be called to pay. Any believer that sets out to sincerely follow Christ will be put at odds with the world that hates Him. We need to understand the principle 
that shared suffering results in shared glory. When we share with Christ's troubles in this world, we share with His glories eternal. This is what the apostles understood in Acts chapter 5 when they had beaten them and they told them, don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And they're, they're set at liberty and they go back to the congregation and the apostles with the wounds and the, and, and the stripes and, and the bruisings, they come back and they don't come and have a pity party. Oh, it's bad. If we preach, they're going to beat us some more. Ain't no telling what's going to happen. No, they come back and they, the Bible says in Acts chapter 5, verse 51, I think, that they rejoiced. They came back and they were ecstatic. They got with the congregation and they said, Church, let's celebrate because God has deemed us worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. <laughs> Friends, they understood. Shared suffering, shared glory. <laughs> now, Here's where I really want to get into. And I'm so glad y'all y'all are in tune this morning. That's awesome because it's it's a little bit challenging of an idea to present. I'm going to read the verses first and then we'll get into the principle. Verses 17 through 18. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So the third principle I want you to see concerning a environment that is hostile towards your faith is this. Behind persecution, there is God's divine judgment. What does this mean? It means God is at work in the trial that you face for that Christian belief. God is at work in the animosity that the people possess towards you and towards your Savior. God is behind it because in this is the seed and the initiation of divine judgment. Now I see you looking at me like, huh? We're going, we're going to get there. I'm going to try to help my best to help y'all understand this. First of all, let me throw this out. Consider a snowball. Because persecution of the church is really like a snowball effect of God's divine judgment. You put a snowball on a hill, you make it good and tight, and then you just kind of give it the nudge. And as it rolls down the hill, it intensifies. It grows bigger and it gets heavier. Now, if you got hit with the snowball on top of the hill, it's, it's going to be inconvenient, uncomfortable, unpleasant, a cold burst of ice. But if you get hit with the snowball at the bottom of the hill, it's liable to flatten. Depends on how big the hill and how sticky the snow. <laughs> You've all seen the cartoons, you know. And <laughs> Bugs Bunny and Daffy rolling down the hill and they engulfed in the snowball. Listen, God's judgment's that way. Persecution's like the snowball that gets it rolling. I want to give you an example of this 
before I bring it home. Think about Old Testament history in the nation of Israel. God's people were at the very first of God's judicial dealings with the world. So when God said, it's time for me to begin to intervene with judgment on the nations. It's time for me to begin to punish evil in the world, not eternally, but here in this world. It's time for me to intervene the first people that caught the judgment of God were the people of Israel. God judged His people first. You know about the Assyrians. You know about the Babylonians. You know how the nation was destroyed. The people were carried away and enslaved. And you know about God's keeping power in their lives because the entire Old Testament tells the narrative. But one thing we fail to see and to realize is that the initiation of God bringing judgment upon His own people unleashes the fury of God on a wicked world. The prophets that testified against Israel, their own race and their own people stood up and said, Thus saith the Lord, God is bringing calamity and judgment on you. Or the same prophets that said, Woe to the nations that God uses against Israel. And woe to the nations that defy Him. Because that initiation of judgment on His own house it's like lighting a fire in the middle of a patch of pine needles. Been there and done that. You light a little fire, boom! <laughs> You're going to be standing there scorched and singed and smoky and looking around at a ring of fury going out from that one place. It could have been a little bitty match and a little bitty fire. But as it spreads, so does the intensity and the severity. God starts His judgment with His people. And it goes out. The encouraging thing is, judgment for God's people isn't ultimate doom. Judgment for God's people is a purifying judgment. A cleansing judgment. Judgment for the world is a not a cleansing, but a calamity. <laughs> judgment for the world is doom, it's destruction, it's ultimate loss. Two different kinds of judgments. I think about it like this. When God begins to look at the church and the church begins to look like the world and God begins to see first of all that we're comfortable. Second of all that we're complacent. And then third when He begins to see that we're compromising. Comfort, complacency, compromise. God don't want us to fall under the judgment of all the rest of the world. So He deals with us. And He deals with us first. And He deals with us sometimes harsh by allowing persecution to come in our lives to remind us was important to point us back to the holy way because I dare say persecution will do two things in your life. It will point you to God and get you on your knees or it will make you just back up and give it up. 
it's going to determine, are you a believer? Are you not a believer? Now, the hard thing for you and I to swallow and the difficulty in our hearts and our minds that we struggle with in today's Christianity is the idea that God in His sovereignty, in His holiness, that God would allow that you and I go through troubles. It seems unthinkable to us that God would allow others to come against us and somehow that works into His plan and prerogative. We don't like that notion. It's not comfortable. It's not what we like to think of God as big and fluffy. But I love what C.S. Lewis wrote in the Narnia Chronicles about the lion Aslam. He said, after all, he's not a tame lion. And he said, is Aslam dangerous? Is Aslam safe? And the character said, safe? Oh, there's nothing safe about the lion. After all, he's not a tame lion. Well, we need to remember about God. God is fierce. No, amen. He's fearsome. Oh, he's good. He's ultimate good. And is he sustaining? Is his grace sufficient? Does he care for you? Absolutely. But God deals with the world in ways that even in our recollections seems harsh and severe. And God allows for things and even and especially persecution that makes no sense in our recollection of what we think God to be. But remember, He spared not His own Son. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53, it pleased the Lord to bruise Him. God poured out His indignation on Christ for our sakes. God's not to be seen as something never dangerous. As long as we hold that ideology, we don't see God from a biblical perspective. The God that gave His own Son to the beatings, to the mockings, to the cross for His redemptive purposes is the same God that allows Christians to undergo persecution for the sake of Christ and for, guess what? Redemptive purposes for their own sake. And you say, well, I don't know. I don't know if I can trust a God like that. And that is the question, by the way. Can you as a believer, can you as a Christian trust a God that isn't all the time fluffy? Can you trust a God that at times deals severe? Even with His people? Well, look at verse 19. In verse 19, we see the final principle about dealing with with a hostile environment to your Christian faith. And that is this. God knows exactly what He's doing. God knows exactly what He's doing. In verse 19, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well doing as unto a faithful creator. Oh, friends, 
I want you to look at that word soul. Suke in the Greek. Every time in my mind and in and, and my imagination, I always picture some ethereal uh, distortion of, of a personality, but but disembodied, you know, like a ghost, you know, who's the soul, you know. That's, a, that's always in my head. I don't know why. I can't even hear the word soul without just seeing a ghost, you know, in my mind, you know, of a person. Always got the face, but everything else is a little foggy, a little misty, you know. It, you almost expect a little tail like Casper, you know, going by. <laughs> but when we look at the word suke and we look at the word soul in the Bible, soul is talking about your ultimate personhood. Who you are. Everything incorporated about you, your personality, your likes, your dislikes, who you are, your soul is who you are. Oh, you have a body, but you are a living soul. And so when we talk about the soul, we're talking about the totality incorporating all of your personhood. And the apostle tells the young Christian converts, when you undergo troubles for your faith because they were undergoing troubles. He says, what you need to do is commit your soul to God because He's a faithful Creator. He knows who you are. He knows what you need. He knows how to secure you in your fiery trial. And He knows what's best to produce the person He wants you to be. And so when the Bible says, entrust your soul to God as a faithful Creator, He's saying, you can put your life in God's hands because He knows what's best for you. And the devil wants to tell you with the trials that are so fiery and those torments and those troubles, Give up on God because He's not looking after you. And after all, He's severe, isn't He? And God is calling us to commit all that we are to His faithful hands. And let Him work His thing in us, in others, and in the world around us. Because after all, He's God, and we are not. <laughs> he knows what He's doing best. The problem with Christians, we always think we can run things better than God. And God allows troubles to bring us to the place where we simply place our souls in His able hands. And that's how we face those fiery trials. I'm going to ask you to stand. Maybe you've been in church a long time. Maybe you've heard the gospel. Maybe you've heard uh, the teachings of the scriptures. But it's never come at you like that presentation that God is expecting you as an individual to entrust your soul to Him. Ultimately, when it's all said and done, and if you was to boil it all down, what is the faith really all about what is the essence of faith it could be defined with that very act that act of entrusting and committing all of our personhood to God as God we can sing surrender we can call it repentance there's so many words that connect to it but 
Really what it's all about is saying, God, you're God, and I need you. Here I am. Maybe today, maybe you know, and you know in your heart nobody else knows, but you've never given your soul to his hands. God is calling you. Why don't you commit to me? This would be the morning for you, friend, to really learn what the faith is all about. You come give your heart and life to Jesus. You come turn all that you are over to Him. You be saved. Maybe you're here, friend, as a believer. Oh, you know the Scripture. You've been born again. There's been time and time again that you just laid it all at the cross. But there's troubles you're facing. There's fears in your heart. And you're beginning to wonder. The devil's bombarding you with doubts. Can I trust God? When he's so fearsome of a being, I want to tell you, friend, what else could you do? The troubles come, the trials come, and life weighs heavy on your being. And you wish you could get out of it. You wish you could go around the hard times, but God leads you right into Him for His own purposes and you begin to think, God, what would you do this to me for? God says, trust me anyway. Trust me anyway. Maybe you're here today, friend, and you're struggling. Trust in God where you're at. I'm telling you, just like the apostle, you begin to give all that you are unto God. And you watch how faithful he is. Oh, is he terrible? Is he awesome? Is he fearsome? Yes. But more than all that, he's faithful. You commit yourself to him you'll find out just how committed God is to you. God's speaking to your heart. You come. Just as
right, church? 